Yes. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to our um, M3 EWB uh, talk. We're really lucky, fortunate, happy, delighted to have um, uh, Dr. Keltner as our speaker today. He is um, a member of one of the six emotional well being networks that N NIH has funded um, to advance the science of emotional well being. Um, and um, he's part of a team that's, uh, I'll let him talk more about that, but sort of a collaboration amongst um, California schools, um, UCSF, UC Berkeley, um, and Harvard. Um, so they're another network. We have the M3 EWB network here from EcoHaft, uh, Sandy Chafolius and I. Um, and so we are sponsoring um, these in-chip talks um, through our network. Um, so I've been working with Docker for the past few years um, on um, trying to figure out what emotional well-being is and, and um, how, to, how to measure it um, and having lots and lots of conversations. So when I um, asked for his bio, um, I, I wasn't too surprised um, to, to sort of get to know more about his background. So he was born in um, Jalisco, Mexico, um, offspring of two early members of the counterculture. Um, which I, I not surprised about. Um, my mother, <laughs> his mother was a literature professor and his father was an artist um, and they raised um, him and his brother in Laurel Canyon in the late 60s. Um, so Docker received his bachelor's from University of California at Santa Barbara, his PhD in social psychology from Stanford, um, did a postdoc at UCSF with Paul Ekman, um, big name in emotions. And then um, he landed his first academic job at University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, and then came back to California and is at Berkeley Psychology Department since 1996. Um, he's a full professor, faculty director of the Greater Good Science Center. Um, he has a very distinguished career, um, has published um, hundreds of scientific articles, um, but what I also think is impressive is Docker is really taking science out into the world, out into the community. So he's published um, best-selling books um, that are directed to the lay public. His his um, the Greater Good Science Center is really directed at applications of what we know about um, thriving and flourishing. Um, he does lots of interviews. He's consulted on movies like um, Pixar's Inside Out. Um, and Seoul. So he's done, he's done what an amazing, interesting career. Um, so we're really lucky to have him. Um, I was just saying earlier that I, I wish we were able to, to meet up in person and, and have more of the uh, interactions that, that are, are such a great part of meeting a person, but we're, we're really grateful he's here. He's going to do a talk. We're going to have um, time at the end for, um, for discussion. So please hold your questions till then, and um, I'll stop talking and turn it over to you, Docker. <laughs> Thanks, Crystal. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, the Maybe the most important thing about this talk is um, those sites there, the greatergoodberkeley.edu, ggia.berkeley.edu. For educators out there, we've at the Greater Good Science Center, we've just launched an, launched an education program at ggie.berkeley.edu, all reaching hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and as Crystal said, to Kind of take the science broadly defined uh, and get it out into a very hungry public for uh, their own application and reflection. Um, this talk is, uh, you know, the emotional well-being a new frontier, and I, I would take away that question mark. It is a new frontier, and it really comes out of conversations with Crystal and Sandy and others that are part of these net NIH networks about how do we really think about this and this construct. And, uh, and phenomenon and dimension to flourishing. Uh, and as, as Crystal suggested, I'm really gonna take a, a real clear emotion perspective on this, which is really my background. So uh, I've got some ideas and I'll uh, end with 15 minutes for Q and A. Um, and I really look forward to hearing what you guys think about this. Um, um, so the first point that really, um, you know, I was a skeptic of the, happiness literature, to be honest, and so forth. Uh, but I've really been convinced by um, some large-scale reviews that, that well-being matters. You all know this. Uh, the public didn't know this some um, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. 
I cite a couple of reviews. Um, and, you know, it's really pretty remarkable when you think about it, you, that you can take a single question, like how satisfied are you with your life? And it tells us a lot about the mind and body. Um, we're learning a lot, as I cite there, about uh, neurophysiology of positive emotionality or happiness from dopamine to oxytocin to the prefrontal regulation of um, the amygdala. Uh, inflammation is really on the, the uh, radar right now. I study the vagus nerve. We've learned a lot about what we've called prosocial neurophysiology. Uh, we know this matters for physical health. Uh, you know, famous meta-analysis of 340,000 people. Uh, just being connected adds 10 years to your life expectancy. And it matters for your relationships and your mind and how productive you are. So this isn't just navel-gazing or, you know, people, <laughs> uh, you, know, um, you know, going to retreats, or whatever. This is just basic to the human condition. Um, by way of background, um, Dr. Vivek Murthy, our Surgeon General, really inspired this in some sense. And, you know, he's really, I think his legacy, having met with his group a few times on this, is emotional well-being. You know, that it is some kind of thing that is beyond the absence of mental illness that helps us be strong and find joy in the face of trauma and adversity and just all the life conditions that are part of living. Um, obviously, I believe, uh, as, um, as do many people, this is more important than ever. Um, in fact, I had Dr. Vivek Murthy on my podcast, The Science of Happiness, which is, you should check it out, it's a lot of fun. And he said, you know, the COVID's horrible, 1 million deaths in the United States, but we're going to have five to 10 years of uh, an emotional recession, if you will. Uh, this is a publication from Lancet, just showing the rise in depression uh, as the during the course of the pandemic, uh, the reds and oranges are higher rates of depression. And, you know, the estimates are, as you well know, 30% rise in major episodes of depression and anxiety, harder on young people. Uh, you probably feel it uh, out in the world, in your work. Uh, this is serious stuff. So in my approach to emotional well-being, and I'd like to um, uh, kind of give you a broad conceptual orientation um, and, and then uh, turn to some specific hypotheses. Um, I, um, and, and it's interesting, you know, working with Crystal and Sandy, um, one of the promises of, of this concept of emotional well-being is there's this vast literature on well-being, tens of thousands of studies, right? Peer review, meta-analyses, massive studies, massive empirical literature, there is a massive emotion literature, you know, a lot going on in Europe and around the world, tens of you know, thousands of studies. And in some sense, they haven't been integrated. Um, and so in light of that, what I'd like to talk to you about is two different approaches that we've been taking in my lab uh, and that are, you know, um, in some sense, interdisciplinary and um, uh, uh, out there in the world. And the first is, um, what I call social functionalism, and we have some new papers out on this that I've cited with um, Alan Cowan and Keith Oatley. And, you know, we've been tricked in the Western European mindset, by the Western European mindset, to think that emotions in this William James sense are all in your mind and so forth, but they're profoundly social. Um, you know, we are a hyper-social species. We accomplished everything from raising hyper-vulnerable offspring to, you know, sharing food in the evolutionary context socially. And a lot of people, you know, Gervin Van Cleef in Amsterdam and Scarantino um, in Georgia, Ursula Hess and others, and, and our lab have really made the case that emotions are vital to our, um, our, our social relationships. They aren't just interior experiences, they are dynamic processes that help the individual fold into the relationships that are part of emotional well-being. They coordinate social interactions. They shape cognition, um, you know, whether we are thinking about harm or risk or justice. Uh, as John Haidt has argued with a lot of controversy but compelling data, emotions in Danny Kahneman's sense our system one, they guide moral intuitions about right and wrong. 
And they are proximal determinants of a lot of the most important actions in our life. Uh, there are reviews showing if you want to know who volunteers, you look at compassion as a, a animator of that action. If you want to know who protests social injustice, anger in one meta-analysis the, is the primary determinant of successful social protest. So emotions are much more than interior experiences. They, they're really the structure of our social lives. The second approach I take, and, and you know, I'll talk about, you'll, you'll feel the reverberations of this perspective when we get to more specific ideas. Um, the second perspective I take, and for you, you know, um, people gathering data out there, uh, young and old, I, I really encourage you to look at the brilliant work of my former student, Alan Cowan. Um, Alan, I, you know, <laughs> Alan studied applied math. He's, he's as much a mathematician and an engineer as a psychologist. And he looked at the emotion space that I've been laboring at for 25 years. And he said, wow, this could really change if we brought in new methods for this field. What he calls uh, semantic space theory. And we've just been publishing very recently articles on this. Um, and, and very, uh, um, Broadly, you know, what this perspective does is you, instead of looking at reporting on a couple of emotions, you report on a lot of emotions. Instead of uh, judging uh, just a few film, film clips to study psychophysiological response, you have people encounter vast arrays of stimuli. You use new kinds of statistical techniques. Um, and these new methods, you know, this is a whole other talk or conversation I'm happy to take up in Q&A, but, you know, when Ekman and Friesen published those six faces, it, it kind of set the world afire in the, the 70s, really was some of the first work on emotion. But that is probably six to eight percent of emotion. <laughs> and it just anchored the field in a lot of different ways. And what this semantic space theory does is it, it really broadens our understanding of what are emotions. And that, in turn, allows us to think more in a more nuanced, rich way about emotional well-being. So what we've learned, and I'll show you some images in just a second, is dimensionality. How many emotions are there? Probably 25 distinct states that we should be thinking about. Are they discrete categories? How are they distributed in a space? No, they kind of blend together in complex ways. And then with certain statistical techniques, you can ask like, in my subjective experience, and well-being ultimately is a subjective experience, what is primary? Um, and a lot of our data suggests that these discrete categories like awe or gratitude or compassion or horror really drive conscious experiences in the affective space as opposed to valence. And I know, that's a controversial statement, but uh, pretty compelling data to speak to that. Happy to take it up in Q&A. These are some, this is the most complicated figure I'll present today, but it, I would encourage you to go to humeai.com or hume.ai to look at the data visualizations. And what it just shows, for example, this is a PNAS paper. People watch 2,100 different videos and, and then Alan maps out the domain, the, the kinds of experiences we have. And there are 27 distinct kinds of experience from awe to beauty, if you follow my cursor, to calmness, to being entranced or not absorbed. You go into the negative spaces, people re readily differentiate anxiety from fear, from horror, from disgust. There are a lot of positive attachment emotions like adoring babies feeling joy, admiring people who matter to you. You see similar differentiation in the realm of the face and the voice. These are all individual faces that are rated in voices, about 25 different emotion specific faces and vocalizations. You see similar richness in a PNAS paper on music from China and the US that people feel this rich array of emotions, things like being joyful and finding it beautiful or calming or dreamy or mystical or awe-inspiring. So the emotion space is three to four times as rich as the Ekman tradition got 
anchored the field on. I think it has a lot of implications, um, but that's really the emotion story. So putting this together, just to give you an illustration, you know, uh, emotional well-being is going to hinge, as a lot of meta-analyses suggest, on positive emotions, you know, and then we'll talk about the negative emotions. Um, just how much positive affect I feel, Sonia Lubomirsky, matters a lot in terms of my health and well-being. And the convergence of these two perspectives I've described to you tell us what interesting emotions we should start to study, right? Like love or compassion. My work lab's done a lot of work on just how important compassion is. The unique benefits of amusement or pride or awe, which I've done a lot of work on. Very interesting emotion, especially for East Asian cultures, contentment. Jeannie Tsai at Stanford saying, emotional well-being in the East Asian context may be more calm you know, and focus on things like contentment and as opposed to excitement and joy in a Western European context. So lots of unexplored territory for us to, to look after, which I find very exciting and, and, um, and uh, um, hope to convey to you some insights. So just to, before we turn to specific hypotheses, a few more orienting notions. I really think, you know, and this is something our network with Crystal and Sandy and others, the different networks have grappled with, you know, how do we locate these uh, different subjective spaces or uh, this conceptual domain? I like Danny Kahneman's view. Emotions are sort of a higher level than sensations, like good tastes of ice cream. They are independent of traits that are studied in the literature, like optimism, and then they feed into this higher order life satisfaction judgment of overall how is life going. Um, just to again orient us to how we could think about emotions, contributions to well-being, these are two of the most um, sort of talked about, cited perspectives. Carol Riff's flourishing of these domains of flourishing, of autonomy, mastery, growth, positive relations, purpose, and self-acceptance. Uh, Seligman's PERMA, builds in some emotionality with positivity, but sort of duplicates in many ways what, and I've color coordinated them here, uh, some of Riff's ideas. And you can see that there is this unique space for emotional well-being to fit into these well-known conceptualizations. They haven't been covered that well, so good work to do. So um, the um, this is, uh, filled with lots of opportunities for us to consider, you know, how does momentary emotion contribute to your well-being, your health, your imagination, the quality of relationships? For those of you doing research, there are wonderful, uh, you know, um, methodologies to deploy here. We can do laboratory studies. We can measure people in vivo in the context. We can study relationships, right? You study friendships or work colleagues or romantic partners. Does the emotional quality of their relation, their conversations matter? Um, there's a lot of work increasingly with new statistics on naturalistic experiences, right? Um, wow, if I'm part of a ritual with friends, how does that boost my sense of well-being? We can look at pharmacological interventions, lots of good stuff to do, lots of good methods. Happy to talk about that. And so I want to... Um, I, I know I have uh, about 20 minutes um, for, I think, four or five ideas that I want to kind of float by you. Um, the first is the principle of positivity and just the, the deep intuition that cultivating positive states matters. Um, this comes out of the meta-analyses of Lubomirsky, Sarah Pressman, I love this quote by the Buddhist practitioner Thich Nhat Hanh. Fear focuses on the past and is worried about the future. If we can acknowledge our fear and acknowledge that we are okay, we, have, we are still alive, our bodies are working, our eyes can see the beautiful sky, our ears can hear the voices of loved ones, we're okay. Um, and then for those of you who have worked through complex life events or traumas or health issues, you have an intuitive sense of that. If, if we can just find positive states, 
we fare better. And a lot of data speak to that. Um, and indeed, that's what these reviews suggest is good news for cultivating positive states. But here are some really interesting questions, right, that this emotion perspective raises, which is, um, what about cases of, quote, negative emotions, um, like anger, right, which promotes social justice, helps with social protests, uh, betters the broader greater good, um, but is feels in the moment negative? How do we conceptualize that in terms of negative of, of emotional well-being? Very interesting work on guilt by Frank Flynn at Columbia showing people who feel guilt, who are managers and leaders, have better teams. Their teams like them more, right? This sense of moral kind of worry or concern enables better collective behavior, negative emotions promoting the good. Second question that this kind of emotion perspective raises beyond positive affect is we probably all have specific emotion profiles. Some of you out there may be compassion people that your life is about ameliorating harm and lifting up people. I've done a lot of work on awe and there are definitely awe prone people, right? That that becomes their defining passion. Uh, and so what does that tell us about the lives they live and well-being? Uh, we should be cautious about too much of a good thing. June Gruber, Iris Moss have shown, man, when you are on the extremes of emotions, right? Like just extreme levels of compassion or awe, it starts to become dysfunctional. So there are probably, you know, curvilinear or quadratic relations between emo emotions and emotional well-being. So lots of interesting questions for us to go after. Building on this, um, this is really, I, my, I had a grad student just present on this last night and it was awesome. Uh, and, and it was, you know, he was using these new statistical techniques that start, you know, elastic nets and these specific kinds of regression techniques that show each of us, when we think about emotion shaping our lives, right, uh, and, and giving rise to the sense of emotional well being. Each of us probably have emotions given our life histories, our attachment patterns, our culture, our social class, our genetics. Each of us probably have emotions that drive well-being more. And what that means is if we're interested in interventions, much like medicine, they have to be targeted to those emotions that really matter to us. He had this finding, usually I don't talk about unpublished science, but this was so intriguing. I had to I'll pass it on. For really um, neurotic people who are worried and ruminate, sadness really drives their, their uh, well-being, right? Other emotions, other people less so, but for that person who's prone to worry, sadness just takes a hit, uh, it, it puts a dent into their well-being. So maybe what we might call principle two is there are real emotions that matter for every individual more, the cardinal, emotion thesis. These are some of my favorite quotes. You get this sense in the literature when you read the great thinkers, you know, from Rachel Carson, who loves awe, to um, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who loves compassion. It really seems like, you know, emotions matter to particular individuals. Adam Smith, the great economist, loved gratitude. They're the most sacred of the beneficent virtues. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. Einstein, this famous quote, uh, um, as, as with Charles Darwin and Rachel Carson and, and Margaret Fuller and others, loved awe and mystery. Maybe our emotional well-being centers upon subsets of the emotions I've been talking about. Uh, and this has a lot of interesting implications. Are there emo superordinate emotions that drive well-being? Like, boy, if you can just cultivate contentment, your work will go well. Or does this predict specific cultural patterns? And indeed, there's recent work coming out of Zurich showing cultures have emotion profiles. And if you as an individual fit that profile, you will have enjoyed greater well-being. If you live in Connecticut 
and the defining emotion just hypothetically is aesthetic beauty and you love your fall leaves and your wonderful you know home your wonderful uh um architecture and the like maybe that emotion is really the key to to finding emotional well-being maybe this helps us understand development that at certain ages you know in early childhood or you know early adolescence 10 11 friendships matter so much and it's just the gratitude of friendships and in adolescence it might be awe right so maybe in, there are specific emotions that drive our well-being uh, in these context specific ways what a rich area we almost know nothing about this i will tell you um, my student joseph ocampo is building a new measure and crystals heard about it in sandy uh, really mapping the space of, of, of emotions, 20 different states. And it's really interesting, your feelings of compassion, more than positive affect, more than pride and other positive emotions, drive the quality of your relationships. That makes intuitive sense, but th there's a benefit of, of looking to these specific emotions. The panis, the most widely cited measure of affect, doesn't have compassion or love, right? And so you go to the specific emotions, you predict more what's going on in your relationships. Um, there are benefits to this. Number three, um, the principle of emotional flexibility. George Bonanno, kind of a pioneer uh, in the study of how we handle stress and trauma. You know, um, you think about, I forgot what the statistics are on how many people have been affected by a death uh, from COVID, the million deaths um, these past couple of years. We are all facing climate crises and trauma and the like. And George Bonanno, really worth reading, uh, his central idea is flexibility. You know, you need to be flexible in your emotional responses to, um, to the difficulties of life, the joys of life. Um, this is a central notion in the emotion literature, dates back to Aristotle in Nicomachean Ethics. Um, just read this to you. We can be afraid or get angry or feel pity, in general have pleasure and pain, both too much and too little. But having these feelings at the right time, about the right things, toward the right people for the right end and in the right way, is intermediate and the best condition and proper to virtue. And at the time, 2,500 years ago, he was writing about what does it mean to live a good life, to have emotional well-being, they would have called it at the time. Virtue is a mean, or it's, as you infer from his quote, it's about flexibility, right? Having the emotions that fit the context, but to the right degree, toward the right people, right? Should you be showing the kind of anger you might need to marshal in a protest toward your children? No, we need this, this, should we be showing compassion towards people who need a little tough love? Probably not. We need flexibility in our emotional lives. Um, there is a lot of interesting work, and in this article that uh, Crystal and Sandy um, spearheaded, hopefully that we'll see the light, of the find uh, the light of day, <laughs> You know, tough to publish on this. And thank you, Sandy and Crystal, for doing that. Um, we comment briefly on, you know, one of the interesting things we can do with emotion science is study people's emotions on a daily basis, study it in the lab, and start to get metrics of flexibility. One is called, this is Jordi Quodbeck, emo diversity. Uh, and in general, what the literature is showing, very preliminary, is the richer my you know, the flex, the, the diversity of my emotions on a daily basis in specific contexts, the better I do, right? Um, there's very interesting work on the variation around the mean. If I have variability in my emotional responsivity, I seem to fare better. Um, and then finally, we can study, as Richie Davidson has, and we report on this on this article, Crystal and Sandy led. How about my emotional dynamics, right? If, can I return to baseline if I get really stressed out? Uh, if I can return to baseline as an index of flexibility as opposed to staying in this stressed out state, maybe I fare better. If I can sort of maintain positive states, I'll fare better. Really cool work on that, very preliminary. 
flexible emotions matter. All right, so we've gone from principle of positivity, principle of um, cardinal emotions, specific emotions really driving well being, the flexibility of the response. And then a fourth idea, again, very central to the emotion literature that kind of the well being science hasn't hasn't really tackled yet, just given different methodological traditions, is, you know, maybe it's good to have coherent emotional responses. Um, when we experience emotions, a lot of processes are engaged. Expressive patterns in touch and body and gaze activity and face and voice. Physiological processes in the immune system the neuroendocrine system, the autonomic nervous system, right? Interpretive processes in the mind of how I look at the world um, that Jen Lerner and I have studied and others. Um, and maybe it's and subjective experience processes, right? We know, you know, on balance, there are probably 0.2 correlations between facial expression, vocalization, and experience. And there's a sense in the literature that maybe we benefit if these are coherent, these different systems of emotion are working together, right, uh, on balance. Very little work on this, but I will direct your attention to uh, work by Iris Moss at Berkeley and others showing, you know, if my physiology is correlated with experience, I enjoy better well-being. Incredible work on interoception by uh, Hugo Critchley and Sarah Garfinkel in England showing they, they measure very subtle indices of the um, autonomic nervous system response in their studies of interoception. And to the extent that you are aware of like systolic blood pressure or heart rate, you make better decisions in life. You handle social situations better. So there's this intuition that we can really start to study with these methods of if I am better representing my emotional experiences, you know, with, with language or, or the systems work together, I'll just have, I'll be adapted, uh, adapting to the context of life more effectively. Um, this is one of the ideas that comes out of the mindfulness literature, the meditation literature, um, uh, that you know, what it, mindfulness does is it, it gives you kind of a better coordination of the systems involved in stress and emotion. Emotional coherence, principle four. Uh, just, just one or two more, uh, and then we'll open it up. Um, this one is fascinating. And, and I think, um, again, you know, I'm struck. And, and, you know, when we started these networks, um, thanks to NIH um, and, you know, led by people like Crystal and Sandy, you know, one of the striking things that the study of emotional well-being offers is this new integration of these two rich literatures that I spoke to, right? That you have all of this knowledge being gained in the emotion space. And I hope I've given you a flavor of that. Um, we have all of this knowledge in advance in the well-being space, how much it matters for kids and the elderly and our immune systems and um, how we do at work, right? And why not synthesize these two traditions? Um, and that's the spirit of, of these principles that I'm offering. Um, and, and we bump into principle five. And, you know, as a social psychologist, I'm fascinated by the prospects here uh, of the idea that, you know, we have these rich languages by which we convey our interior states to other people of emotion uh, in the voice and in the face and in touch. And, and maybe um, there are benefits to knowing others and being known that as we go to work and interact with our colleagues, and we try to raise children in today's complicated world, and we handle, you know, we walk through the seat streets of New York, and we navigate those streets, and we um, we have our friends. Maybe there are well-being benefits to being savvier, uh, sort of uh, perceivers of the emotional world. 
Um, maybe it benefits if we know what other people's feel, other people feel, and complementarily, if other people know what we feel. The bent, the principle five of knowing others and being known. I, I'm really intrigued by this. We're doing a lot of work on this at UC Berkeley right now that, that speaks to the benefits of this. Let me just cite a couple of relevant ideas out there. You know, this is in some sense the core of the emotional intelligence literature that was pioneered by Jack Mayer and Mark Brackett and Peter Salovey. Um, and Mark Brackett, whose work I really admire at Yale in, with the Ruler program, finds just in general, wow, if you can teach kids how to be astute judges of other people's emotions, and if they can be sort of wise expressors of emotions and show some coherence, they have better friendships, they enjoy, they do a little bit better in school, they handle stresses better, right? That it, it benefits to know others' emotions and to be known, to have people know what your feelings are. Um, you know, we're replicating that and extending that with all these new emotions in adults, that if you're a, a good judge of, of the voice and uh, a facial expression and bodily expression of emotion, um, you, in, in, you fare better in your social relationships. There's work showing, you know, that just a little bit of work, if you feel like you're able to express your emotions, you're better known, right? You, you enjoy better well-being. And then, of course, the well-being, the, you know, really influential work of James Gross and Oliver John really converges with this idea that at least in Western European contexts, it's different for East Asian contexts, David Matsumoto has shown. But when we suppress our emotions um, in Western European contexts, it costs you in terms of your social well-being, how well you're getting along with other people, how well you do academically for college students, your physiology, right? Shutting down these signals to others um, costs you. Uh, and so it, it really aligns with this deep principle of the benefits with respect to kind of clear emotional expression, knowing what other people are feeling as a pathway to broader kinds of well-being. Uh, this is a crazy figure, but Dan Cordero, C-O-R-D-A-R-O, -O, uh, and then this is Bill complementing Alan Cowan's work on expression. Um, we've done a lot of work. This is a paper from 10 different cultures um, showing that there's this rich language of emotion of 20 different states that I've portrayed here that range from subtle expressions of sympathy to feeling coy, to feeling just content, uh, to laughing and feeling amusement, uh, to being interested in other people, to feeling pain. Um, there are these signals out there. We, uh, and, and this broader literature is issuing a challenge, which is, we're, which we're finding really cool data. As I become a sort of a rich, sort of uh, judge of these emotions, my emotional life works better. Much as, you know, if you take a class on music and you learn more about music, um, your appreciation of music goes better. If you uh, learn, take a cooking class and learn about all the nuances of cooking and flavor, your experience of, of sensory delighted food probably is enhanced. The same is true of the emotion world, the, of being known and knowing others in this rich language is good news for our well-being. Um, and that really uh, fits kind of a final notion that I'll just uh, call representational richness that's getting a lot of um, really interesting attention. Just, you know, a slice of emotion is what we call conceptualization. Uh, Klaus Scherer called it such 2013. What is my language and metaphors and you know, imagery and how do I use art to represent my emotions? And on balance, the richer the language, the better we do, right? Matt Lieberman at UCLA, if I just label sort of threatening things, uh, the amygdala is uh, quieter in its activation. Work by Lisa Feldman Barrett and others on granularity and then the alexithymia literature, the richer my language of emotion, I just, I just do better in my social relationships. I can handle those contexts. Um, the, let's not forget music and art. 
you know, this, there's neat work by Keith Oatley and art therapy, just if I can just capture all the richness of emotion with music or art, um, I, I do better, I fare better in life. It's, it just brings me meaning. And then Jamie Pennebaker, of course, very important work on expressive writing. All of them speak to this, this underlying idea of the more rich my representation of the emotions out there and in me, um, good news for my psychological functioning. So um, lots of good work to do, as I hope you feel. There are wonderful methods to test this from daily diary experiences to dyadic interactions to neuroscience. Um, just to give you a promise of where this can go, Maria Monroy, first generation um, uh, student, now PhD, uh, we just published a paper on how awe benefits us, right? You can take a very specific focus on awe, a specific emotion, track its specific effects, as you see in this middle um, space here, that are emotion-specific effects, and indeed, it tends to have a lot of different uh, pathways, uh, benefits for mind and body that are emotion-specific. There are benefits here to going to this more specific level of representation. I'm gonna skip this. This is an awe study we did because we're running out of time. What I'll just tell you is we took veterans and uh, under-resourced teens out rafting, studied their cortisol, their emotions, followed them for a week. And I, I love this finding that for a week after the trip, veterans had a 30% drop in PTSD that was mediated by only by experiences of awe. So um, there's so much here um, to, to do. I think this is, um, you know, just in the conversations with Crystal and Sandy and the, the members of these different networks on emotional well-being. Um, this is uh, an exciting new frontier. Um, you know, when you think about what we're learning about these 20 to 25 emotions, the power, the, just how essential emotional well-being is, as Vivek Murthy suggested, uh, I wish I was younger because there is so much good work to do. Um, and I've given you some citation, some free links to go here, uh, the, you know, and, and resources, um, greatergood.berkeley.edu, GGIA. I have a new book on awe coming out that is uh, in, written in this spirit in January you can, you can get. Um, and uh, with that, I'd just like to say thank you for your attention. Uh, and I really look forward to your questions and comments. Um, and, I, and I hope, you know, you all keep track of what's happening at the University of Connecticut. Um, you know, Crystal and Sandy are uh, pioneering, really driving kind of the conceptualization of what this thing is that Vivek Murthy has encouraged us to think about. And I think there are going to be many good fruits of that endeavor. Thank you. Getting lots of uh, virtual applause there. Um, that's great. Uh, just a wonderful talk and a great overview. I see there's a, a number of people uh, got got um, hands raised, and I, I think Josh put in the chat that the people are muted, so you can just go ahead and ask your question. I guess we'll start with um, Oscar. Or did you have a question? I thought I thought I saw your hand raised. Maybe you were just clapping. <laughs> um, Blair, you have a question? Um, yeah, hang on a second here. Let me get my ear the, the way it needs to be. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I was going to ask you a really nice cross cutting, um, but a couple of dimensions I would have liked to hear, hear you expand on. Um, one is, um, okay, as much attention as there is to all this emotion and um, all these positive effects, I don't think I heard you say anything about pain or chronic pain. Yeah. And yeah. and the other one is um, uh, on the therapeutic side of things. Yeah. Um, of course, a lot of us are very interested in the effects of mindfulness. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you think? Yeah. Wow, Blair, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, one of the, um, if you go, to, we've studied pain, we've studied the pain expression and the vocalization, it's, it's a deep, you know, it is clear, a clear signal. 
Uh, and and I think you know it's a lesson in that that Ekman tradition that anchored us so narrowly to six states ignored pain. And there are huge pain literature. It's it's a multi billion dollar problem in the United States. People taking opiates. Uh, it's a pain phenomenon. And so, you know, and that is a central, it's the most complicated epidemic the U.S. has faced. Uh, and what I'm excited about is, uh, and actually our pain work has, is now being used by people working on pain as a way, how do you know it's real? How do you know how to prescribe somebody opiates that are legitimate, right? And, and we've got, people are using the pain expression, their vocalizations of pain, and, and so this allows us to start to get very specific on that dimension, as you say, Blair, of suffering, which is physical pain. Um, great advances to be made. I, you know, I know right now we're, I've taught mindfulness for, I've never studied mindfulness, but people always ask me to teach it. Um, I, you know, and, and go to the Greater Good Science Center website, great coverage of it. I believe in it. You know, I think uh, I know there are critics out there right now. There's a new paper out. It doesn't work for teenagers. But what does work for teenagers? I challenge you. <laughs> Maybe psychedelics. Um, and you know, I'm cautious there. Um, but yeah, you know, I think what the mindfulness literature has done, you know, and the broad strokes are it's good news, is it, you know, I teach it to medical doctors. They're very hungry for this. Um, very hungry. Their patients are very hungry for this. Um, and Vivek Murth, this network will open up those opportunities in healthcare. Um, what I like about mindfulness, I'll, I'll synthesize with what I talked about, is what I try to convey is like, hey, we've got these amazing emotions, these amazing ways to make sense of our emotions. Find the ones that work for you and, and put them into a mindfulness context of safe space, quiet, fine. You know, so for me, I love awe. You know, it's just, it's, and so I make sure three minutes, five minutes a day, I'm mindfully finding awe. So I, I like it and, and promote it, you know, and I know there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of critiques out of it out there right now, but it's doing good work for the world. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so uh, Oscar did have a question um, that he put in the chat because his microphone's not working. To what extent should we consider personality and temperament when designing client-centered social emotional interventions? Oh my God! Ah. <laughs> you know, I I don't want to. You know, you know, Oscar, what a fundamental question. You know, when I teach human emotion, and then you bump into the, you know. You bump into the, so if personality has an emotional core, uh, a temperamental core as developmental psychologists like to say, like, I'm just fearful, like, and anxious, like runs in my family. Um, those, the heritability, that's 50% of the story, 30 to 50% of the story, right? And um, if you look at the heritability literature broadly, um, it's just real, you know? And when I look at my mom's family of, deep anxiety, OCD, it's just the patterns are there, right? And it helps. And so as somebody designing interventions, like you suggest, we have to attend to that. You know, we have to, you know, we've got data. Sorry, I keep talking about awe. Uh, open to experience people who really love art and new ideas. They love awe. That's their magic. If you're a conscientious, uh, or extroverted, you love excitement and you know social connection and enthusiasm. Those are different emotional profiles. And you give the extrovert the awe thing, and they're gonna be like, well, that's kind of corny or whatever. So we, we do have to take that into consideration. Um, and I would, you know, suggest um, you know, we've got a new measure of 20 different items of your emotional profile, 10 positive emotions. And you can tailor stuff according to that, you know, you, you, in the negative space, you may be shame prone. And that's really different than sadness that's masked by this valence effect of emphasis. Those are different profiles altogether that need different uh, interventions. So I think it's a fundamental issue we often really shy away from. So thanks for bringing it up. 
That's a big, big topic. Um, yeah, that is. Her hand raised. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a question about epistemology of rich language systems for our emotional experience. Yeah. Because clearly, yes, we do come equipped with our genetic inheritance and that you spoke at several different points about the goodness of fit that we might have within a cultural environment or within a given situational context, like a classroom. Um, but can you speak a little bit about how we acquire that rich language and awareness? Because certainly we all are pointed towards intervention science and trying to identify what we can do, what are the levers we have to try and increase people's lexicon for how they're feeling so that they can find those pathways to expression and to belonging that you talked about. And I wondered if you felt like there's developmental sensitivity in addition to cultural sensitivity and whether or not you see a thread winding between those for the most promising avenues for in the teaching of, the acquisition of that richness of emotional experience. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a question that needs about 20 years of research, you know. Um, yeah, you know, when, when I, first thing is, you know, um, when I teach this, like, and I really draw upon the developmental psychologists and anthropologists um, and sociologists that we are, acculturated into ways of emotion, you know, that it's part of discourse. And, and the, the children's books that, you know, that people read and, and the language that mom and dad and caregivers use and moms and moms and dads and dads, whatever the case may be, that you see here on the playground. And, and so we need, um, I think, this complementary approach to tackle your question, which is to think about new ways to study discourse, emotion discourse. Um, like at UCLA, they just study family dinners, you know, and what are we talking, how are we talking about gratitude or suffering at, at family dinners? And those will have deep family culture specific approaches. Uh, and that's going to be very culturally rich and nuanced and, and you can only do locally. But at the same time, I do believe in these principles of richness, right? That, you know, and, and, and multiplicity, emotion science has been too hung up on words, single words, uh, you know, oh, let's measure it with 10 words or 20 words. What about metaphors? What about music? What about color? What about images? Uh, and, and I think the field will move toward that guided by this local specificity we've got to capture with other kinds of methods. But this core principle of Representation is good news, you know, um, and I think that's where the future is. So I would try to design according to those two principles. Thank you so much. Yeah, we do a lot of storytelling work with moms and children to try and see that. So yeah. thank you. Hello. Uh, Great. Hi, um, my name is Ting. Thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation. I learned so much. I mean, as a uh, parent, mother of two young kids, and also you um, are UX designer in healthcare. So my question is about, um, you mentioned the emotional intelligence. So, I mean, from parent's side, even from designer's side, I was yeah. thinking, how can we like um, uh, using mHealth technology to measure the feeling because when, from my side, like when I'm facing two young children, eight and five, when it was like angry or sometimes difficult to speak out their feeling, how like um, can we using some like a technology way to help them to speak yeah. out or match the feeling? So I'm very curious to hear your like um, um, kind of like opinion about this side using M Health technology to measure the feeling. Yeah. Thank you, Ting. Um, what great work you're doing. And, and I, I'll just direct all of you to my former PhD student, Alan Cowan, at Hume.ai. Alan, uh, Alan is the mind behind those computational maps I showed you. And he's built um, algorithms to, to capture naturalistic facial expression, vocalization, prosody, the tone of our voice and words. And so if you're, and this is to the earlier question, if you have a patient who comes in, in a clinical setting, and you're trying to figure out where they are phys mentally, physically, uh, he'll be able to say, 
you know, just with the words and the body and the tone of voice, like that's shame. And it's hard to talk about shame, you know. Um, and and that and he's got a whole ethical nonprofit that makes sure we do this in a, a ethical way. Go to Hume AI. And and he's solved a lot of those problems. He's got a team of 14 engineers. Uh, he's uniquely situated to do it. And what that allows you to do, I did a lot of this work in tech. Um, you know, you have a, a 13 year old who is showing stuff that looks like it could be self harm uh, online. And this is happening all the time. And what we need are these new technologies to say, man, that looks worrisome. That looks like it predicts harmful behavior. And, and Alan's got the technologies that give you the emotional science for that. So thanks for asking. Hume AI. It's all free, by the way. Wow. Um, we have a couple more questions and we have two more minutes. So uh, Sinjin and Kenneth both have their hands raised. So first of all, Dr. Keltner, a wonderful talk. Thank you for your words. I, it was very fascinating. Um, so I come from um, this idea of well-being from a more um, health psych basis. Um, yeah. and so I'm, I'm looking at it because um, I'm going to make things in stress management in my research. And so I was wondering if you, I can get your, um, your thoughts on this because obviously well-being is a very, very broad, yeah. very big topic. Yeah. And it's multidimensional. And, how, and I want to wonder how does, um, in your opinion, mental, um, emotional well-being as itself fit into this whole big um, – picture, I guess. If it, that, that makes sense, I guess. Does that ever make sense? That's what we've been <laughs> grappling with for two years. And it, it's a hard question. I go back to that Kahneman view, like emotions are in this space. And then one of you very astutely asked about emotional traits and temperament. And that's a separate piece that's independent of these transient states that we can measure at any moment of the day right now, right? Those are two parts of the puzzle. Above is health physical health and then life satisfaction. And I think we're gonna, you know, where does it fit, Sinjin? It's like my emotion profile at any moment of the day, which we can measure, 20 different emotions, is gonna give rise to health profiles. That's a, those are separate domains conceptually and measurement wise. It will give rise, as I hinted at with a couple of slides, to how do I feel about life? You know, it's life satisfaction uh, and, and you guys, your questions today all pointed us to the future of like, we've got to start individualizing this and look at like, man, if I'm the, if I'm the uh, compassion person and that's a defining piece of my temperament and, and emotional life, what, is, how, what are the nuances to well-being to that? What are the specific health benefits? Uh, and we're starting to chart that. And so I think it's a separate part conceptually and measurement wise that I hope these networks will start to move toward in the work that we do. So thanks for returning us to that question. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, well, so we're at time. Um, Kenneth, do you have a real quick question? Maybe you could run by? Sure thing. Um, I'll keep it as concise as possible. Thank you, Dr. Keltner, for the talk. Um, I have a lot of interest in your directions uh, defining awe as a distinct emotion. and. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the role that um, immediate infrastructure or surrounding people, how that plays a role in their ability to access this kind of extraordinary yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, when we think about some typical elicitors of all like yeah. natural vistas or, um, you know, these kind of very scenic places, we when we imagine the experiences of uh, families that are kind of yeah like, uh, worked in, in, a, in a cycle that doesn't let them access these places even if it's uh the park three blocks away yeah what are the the tools or what are the the yeah. methods that we can use to promote access to that kind of whether it's R or just in general tools to access yeah. um tools that improve their emotional well-being man Thank you. What a great question to end on. Um, yeah, you know, I've been studying awe for 15 years, have this book coming out, and, um, and it's brought, you know, the couple of things. Uh, awe is, we feel it about two to three times a week, so it's possible every day. It has enormous health benefits. It reduces inflammation, reduces cortisol, 
um, as two examples. Um, it people think stereotype awe is being for the privileged. You only you only feel it at the opera. Not true. Um, actually, Paul Piff, UC Irvine, horror people feel awe more often, um, which is interesting to me um, and fits my own lived experience. Um, and, and then a lot of people have been reaching out about how do we use public spaces and designed environments to cultivate this, like you said, you know, Ken. And I'll give you some examples. Um, California has a movement. Every citizen should be 10 minutes away from a park. Um, you know, the U.S. has great park systems. So, you know, how do you design public transportation to get somebody to a park and give it to them for free? Um, the, um, there is a lot of awe coming in curricula uh, around this, um, we had, we tested an awe walk for elderly people, build awe into their daily walks. Doesn't matter where they are, urban, rural environments. Um, and then a lot of people are thinking about, you know, it astonishes me. Uh, I just went through a very traumatic health event with my brother. Um, our, our hospital systems are, don't have awe in them. You know, they, they, they could be more beautiful. Scandinavia does this, right? Uh, you know, nature scenes, et cetera, music. So this is this is an easy fix for a lot of complicated systems in the United States. And there's a lot of really energized work around this that, you know, how do you build awe into just our lived environment, uh, knowing that it brings so many different benefits. And so it's a great question to end on. Thank you. And I hope you do the work. It's a Cool thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Docker. What a what a wonderful day. Um, and thanks everybody for your attention and participation. It's really great. I gotta run. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.